live from Palo Alto, California, it's The Q at Pier 2.0. Brought to you by the Pier 2.0 Foundations. Learn, connect, and grow. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Welcome back, everyone. We're here live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's uh, flagship program. Go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, with my co-host Jeff Frick, here at Pier 2.0, an organic, ground, groundbreaking organization pulling all the internet executives together, experts and engineers, talking about the future of networks. Our next guest is Paul Unbehagen, Chief Architect of IAD Networking, co-author of IEEE, Shortest Path Bridging. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Um, so obviously, you know, Networks are hot, right? Networks, some say the networks are the bottleneck uh, with all the uh, advantages in compute, cloud virtualization. A um, lot of activity, software defined networking has exploded, different paths, all this stuff going on. So what's the, what is the state of the union in networking and, and what's underneath that's, ch that's forcing all this change? Uh, well, there's a whole lot of different drivers out there causing change. I mean, everything from the proliferation of tablets and a few years ago, the idea of a tablet you know, going to a desk didn't really exist, right? We had the original tablets, but they didn't take off like we had. At a data center, we've got servers who are now very virtual, moving around, right? And they're making a single environment look like many, many different environments, single multi-tenant. We're also watching a proliferation of devices with the internet of things, drive things, so it means enterprises have to start thinking like their service providers, because they don't want to put the MRI in the same network, say, with guest wireless, and that kind of <laughs> creates some interesting issues. You know, for NFV a doctor's is line. hot right now, too. NFV as well, you're trying to make sure you got service chaining involved in that as well. Um, this is a catch-up, quite honestly, in the networking space. I mean, for the last 20 years, we've been reusing the same protocols to operate a network that's been very static, when, if you think about what I just said, everything connecting to this is very dynamic, moving around, and the original networking models, you didn't like things to move around. You wanted things to stay where they were, and now you have to deal with things that are mobile. And everything is mobile. All, your entire edge is a mobile environment, right? Whether it's VMs or tablets. So what are some of the things involved? Okay, so like provisioning, people think about like, a, you know, providing ports, packet tra uh, traversing net different networks. Um, uh, SB, SPB, shortest path bridging is a paper you wrote. What does that mean? I mean, define what that is in context to some of these trends. So, short path bridging, and there were a whole lot of very talented people I worked with in, in creating a protocol. It, it was a, uh, a child of necessity of growth and where we looked at the uh, migration beyond spanning tree into dealing with a mo mobile environment. Like for example, uh, for years we've been deploying data centers where, and I say years, I would say two years. It's been, as we look at the growth of this thing. Internet so, years. And internet <laughs> years, yes, you have to be very clear on that. <laughs> we're no longer dealing with spanning tree. You know, we're dealing with all the issues of, hey, I want to move a VM from rack one to rack 48. That would have been a nightmare in the old world. You know, it's VLAN mapping, all sort of stuff, and you see other ways of trying to deal with it now with overlays and VXLAN and things like that. But you could also use the native layer in combination with that, right? So that you can actually go straight on the Ethernet, say, I want to move a VM from here to there, and the protocol just learns and moves it. And that all happens within a few milliseconds, right? That is a huge boom to a data center environment where basically the network disappears. It becomes nothing more than a black box, and you just do the services you want to do. Right? That's a very important thing, is that the network has to stop being a, a limiting factor, a speed bump in deploying services, and now it's become an enabler of turning on new services. Is that workload driven? I mean, is that becoming uh, the key driver, workloads? We hear that buzzword a lot in, in IT and yeah, in data centers. Yeah, it's an overloaded term. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's over, you know, oh, the workloads are driving it, but it kind of comes down to the, where the pressure points are. Yes. With, you know, with vertically integrated applications, they have certain requirements. Yeah. Um, but now you, <laughs> in virtualization, you can spin servers anywhere. So where's yeah. the so where's the drivers? The network adapting to the change from the workload app, and how does it all connect in? Um, honestly, I think it's even simpler than that. It's money, it's budget. Every environment I know in, in this world is having an issue of their budgets are shrinking. They're asked to do even more and more every year, and that workload means that term means something completely different from one environment to another environment. If I walk into the hospitals who've deployed SPV versus I walk into the stock exchange that's deployed SPV, both have, their workload requirements are different. How we solve the problem is going to be similar because basically their problem was born in the fact that the network is very static, it didn't adapt, it, it didn't allow them to be mobile, but then you also have now they're free to do the things they put off for years, that workload pressure. 
and healthcare, it's epic. It's all the other things, doctors moving around on their, their tablets and wanting to look at radiological data as they're sitting there with the patient just after the MRI was done. And the stock exchange is quickly delivering quotes. It's being able to move VMs around and virtualize and deal with outages. That dynamic So you're saying important. the optimization points have to be dynamic in the sense of the problems are still the same, managing mm -hmm. the, di the infrastructure, but to be prepared to be dynamic based upon the optimization objective, moving around mobile yeah. or trading high volume transactions. Absolutely. The expectation of the user base has changed so dramatically in the last two years that if we don't adapt the network, we're going to be a stale stalemate in the environment. That's a big part of this aspect of, on both the campus side with wireless LAN, it's the same problem as in the data center with virtual machines. Everything's mobile, everything's moving, and that creates a pain point because to do this usually means in a previous life you had to spend millions of dollars to start doing this. This is a different thing now too we're talking about. You don't have to spend millions of dollars. Right. Right? So that expectation is just driven by people, you know, we talk a lot about the consumerization of IT and people's expectations Absolutely. are really driven by what they can do on their phone now. Mm -hmm. And why can't I do all this other stuff? Absolutely. But the other thing that always happens uh, in any situation, right, is you move to your next point of failure, right? You've got a system with interconnected parts. As soon mm -hmm. as you fix one or you invest for, for improvement here, then it just, it just kind of moves the bottleneck to a different part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how's that impacting? What's the next kind of big bottleneck or the current big bottlenecks that you guys are working on? Automation. Right? There's a whole lot of buzzword in the industry about SDN and what SDN is, and quite honestly, SDN is a, it's purely in its infancy about what it is and what it can be. It means a lot of different things too to a lot of different people, but the fundamental issue about SDN, what it's trying to solve, is automation. So SDN to one person might be OpenFlow, to another person might be VXLAN, to another person it might be automating attachment to the fabric, you know, something like SPB. Uh, but the reality is you could actually use all three together at the same time. What you're really trying to solve is, Make it easier to deploy all these things because human beings can't be involved in every single configuration point anymore. When you think about the consumerization IT, everyone's got three to four devices. You've got light bulbs with IP addresses. You've got trash cans with IP addresses. Then you've got an explosion of virtual machines. There are doctors' environments right now they are talking about putting an IP address in a pill for you to swallow. Do you really want one. to be involved in all this? You know, so it's kind of interesting when we think about what Internet of Things are. Right. It's a lot of different things we probably haven't even imagined yet. And the role of big data has been big. I want to ask you the big data question because we were just with Jay Adelson on earlier talking mm -hmm. about the social web and you know, some things just become not categories anymore. They become like just native part of the fabric. And you know, big data has been involved in networks for a long time, data centers. Oh, yeah. People using data for probes and all kinds of network management stuff. So as big data comes in with the tooling, have you seen any cool innovations around that? Because you bring up Internet of Things, that's essentially a big data problem. It's it just another right. device on the network yeah. to deal with. And there's obviously SLAs and QoS <laughs> required to, depending upon the trickle effect coming from the device. Yeah. So, so how does big data play into the network? What, what innovations are you seeing around use of data? So it's an interesting question. I kind of look at it maybe slightly different than a lot of other people because I look at it from, okay, oh my God, there's a whole lot of devices coming in the network. How are we going to deal with this? All right? I have to empathize with all the guys who actually have to run these environments and they don't live at a console managing a switch. They live at managing everything that's coming into this thing. And it does go back to this automation slant, but it also goes back to the fact that when you're moving to a converged environment, and you've got real-time applications, and real-time means something different to you versus you know, Jeff, that becomes an issue because, for example, a doctor's real-time expectation for his voice talking to another doctor in another country while he's doing surgery, right, versus a radiologist trying to download a whole bunch of radiological data, which is huge, if you're not doing QoS properly, if you're not doing traffic reservation properly on this conversion environment, you're going to have major issues for the actual user experience. And I, that's the biggest thing with big data that we have to constantly take a, a aspect from. So I'm always going to approach it from a network perspective because that's my background, yeah, yeah. right? Because at the end of the day, the plumbing, if the plumbing doesn't work, you know about it. When the plumbing works and it's invisible, your life is happy. <laughs> right? Of course, when an application breaks, everyone just blames the network anyway, so. So the, in the old days, it used to be the pager goes off. What's the new, what's the new pager? I mean, what goes uh, off? Cell phones, is it text, is it automatic I think no one of the notifications? Things, <laughs> one of the fun things actually I've seen kind of grow out of this thing is, is, is it's watching social media hit network management. For example, we have switches that will actually IM you, all right, that there's a problem. Then you can IM back to the switch and I see a CLI command and it come back and you can do that in a group chat and a group text actually on your cell phone. So that's kind of an interesting way of looking at things differently. There's yeah. also some interesting things we're, we're playing around with where the idea that you could have a tablet and instead of having to have a PC console to a box, 
as you get close to the switch, you're now consoled into the switch, and making life a little easier to actually. I mean, connect. the personalization aspect of data is interesting because now you can only not only get real time information, a la network management uh, concept, but also predictive analytics. Yes. I mean, the predictive analytics oh, yes. opportunity is huge. Oh, I love the analytics aspect of this. I'm a, I'm a big metrics guy. <laughs> I the more metrics you have as an engineer, and engineers love metrics. It means. You kind of geek out on the fact you can do some stuff with this metrics, and the metrics section in its own case is its own big data. Because now I, you know, in a lot of environments I can tell, hey, what's the delay in general loss between these two endpoints before I do vMotion? What's the performance of that doctor who's experiencing the environment before he calls me, he's complaining that there's a problem in that network? What's all this kind of combination? We now have that available to us, we didn't have a few years ago. Let's talk about virtualization. We're big fans of VMware, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, the beautiful campus in Silicon Valley, very well you know, designed nature. It's just like, it's the new HP in my mind in the valley, it's like growing company. But they came from a, just a single app and yeah. now full on platform. And virtualization certainly changed, certainly with cloud, open stack of these environments where you know, the role of the hypervisor is kind of blending into the fabric. Um, so that battle for the hypervisor changes. So, so yes. where do you see VM, VMware going, or virtualization in general, you mentioned vMotion. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the nirvana for data centers is to treat geography mm -hmm. like it doesn't exist. So that's a lot of <laughs> speed of light, there's <laughs> physics problems. Yeah, yeah. Break that down for the future of virtualization. So, Virtualization is going to become far more ubiquitous than we ever imagined. It's going to leave the data center as well. The concept of what a data center is is also going to change dramatically for a lot of people out there. I think for a lot of people, they think of a data center as just being this big building off to the side. But another thing you're going to start to see is smaller environments out there that are located off-site become arms off the data center, where I can start moving VMs, say, closer to users for improved experience. And having that ability to move it on the fly is something that you couldn't do before we really, VM really pioneered that environment, right? VMware pioneering that helped us do some things that are pretty powerful. Um, that's that point though, is that we couldn't do that because VMware was, was stuck with the old world of networking. They couldn't move that, because to move that VM, you have to keep your IP address, you have to keep your MAC address, and from a networking world, that's a bad thing to do. You never move an IP address somewhere else in the network, right? Creates whole havoc. Now, we can do that with protocols like SPV. You grab that VM, drag it across the network. I don't care if it was in LA one day and New York the other day. Right, or in two different closets, two racks. It's all one virtual yeah. integrated environment. Move the compute where the storage is, move where the data is, yep. is all this. Or stretch it out. You know, we think about a three-tiered architecture, what VMs are typically used. You have your application tier, your web tier, and all behind it, by the way, you got this database tier. And typically, they're all located directly with each other in a couple of racks. Hey, what happens though if I can grab that web tier and actually move it closer to the user? Now the response from the web tier becomes faster and you can kind of distribute it out there in your cluster, and your database didn't have to move, it's too heavy. You don't want to pick that up moving around too much, but <laughs> web's pretty light. You can do creative things now that you couldn't do in the past. So let's, let's kind of like break this down. So you're basically saying all this flexibility and agile-like features yes. of moving resource around is now going to be the new normal. So what if that's mm -hmm. a pretty transformative concept to think about where we've come from Absolutely. and where we are in the market. What's that going to enable in your, in your mind's eye? What are the, some of the things that, that, that will be coming up and, and the fruit off that tree will be what? New apps, new experiences, what do you see? I think it's going to drive a lot of different things and there's a lot of things we don't know we don't know yet. But one of the interesting things I'm watching in the environment as people start adapting to this is a, uh, a realization that you have to think differently. Everything you've known for the last 20, 30 years, you have to adapt your way of thinking of how you use it. Right? So we used to think we build colossal buildings and we got to build around this protocol or that protocol. Now, you don't think about colossal buildings. You do have colossal buildings, but how do we use them in combination? We use them to do more creative things of deploying the services, like I said. You're able to, to, to kind of twist your thinking to say, now that I have this freedom, what are the things I put off for years because I couldn't do, they were too expensive or too complicated, which was also goes back to OpEx costs, which is a good 80% of costs in any environment is OpEx. A lot of people think the cost is buying the boxes and the switches and the VMs, no. It's running the environment. When something breaks, it's an incredible cost memorization. Now when something breaks, we've got that analytics, we've got a lot of information, and now that we can feel more comfortable about that, we can do more with these environments. It frees us. So Paul, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Talk a mm -hmm. little bit about the impact of open source um, oh, yeah. in the networking world. It, right, it used to be people would get together, we'd define a standard, we'd define a protocols, and it's actually interesting that GE and Cisco are leading a pretty, it looks like from the outside, a successful effort mm -hmm. around Internet of Things and coming up with some industry protocols. But now, we get the whole open source movement that's, that's moved from the operating system uh, and continues to proliferate through the stack, where it's really the the, the, every, it's the everybody yes. that goes in and starts to define really what the standards are. Talk a little bit about the impact of open source in the networking world, goodness, badness, and, and where do okay. you see that going? I'm a huge fan of open source. Uh, having worked in Linux for many years, I love 
everything about open source, and I also have lived through the pain of open source, right, in the early days. And there, that, that's a, a clear de delineation here. You got a dichotomy of, uh, the ability to, to quickly have multiple eyes on a problem, it's not led by a single vendor, you've got the actual problem set defined to the real user base. That's a fantastic aspect of the open source. Um, the other issue though, on the other side of this dichotomy is, well, who's going to support you when something breaks? Does this require a whole lot of configuration and software development, and are you an environment that can take that on? Right? Do you even have a software development team who've got PhDs and master's degrees in software development? Um, or is there some middle ground where you can grab off the shelf things, like OpenStack is a phenomenal example of something that's got package environment that allows an IT organization to quickly deploy an Amazon Web Service like functionality. It's pretty complicated to set up. It's not for the faint of heart, but it's getting a lot easier today than it ever was a few years ago. That's going to help drive a lot of innovation. And to me, that's the biggest thing that we can actually drive out of open source open standards, right? So as we work with the ITF and the IEEE and open source environment as a big, nice triangle of, of development, it drives innovation to the real problem, right? Not to a single vendor's proprietary direction. Right. And that's a real strong statement there because the Internet of Things is no longer driven out of a certain particular vendor market set. It's coming from everywhere. And you know, like I said, I mean, trash cans have IP addresses. You ever think you're going to be talking to a trash can vendor about your network? Right? Oh, by the way, that means that the trash can has an IP address. Guess what? There's a server somewhere managing them. Right, right. right? Because it's important for uh, security. You want to know if a heavy package was dropped in a trash can, because that could be a bomb. Right? So that has a whole lot of cascading effects to it. Ripple things that we, you know, unintended consequences right, and reasons. Right, right. So on the future of networking, let's talk about the big players. Cisco, Juniper, they're the incumbents. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a lot of legacy involved. East, West, North, South mindset, you know, and certainly Juniper's un been under some management changes recently. Um, Cisco, obviously, the whale of all, is getting in the server business. Mm -hmm. You see what they're doing on the server side, been very successful. Um, where is the converged infrastructure going? I mean, the data center is the future, obviously, how it gets materialized, whether you're a service provider or an enterprise looking to get those arms out there and using vMotion, things like that. Mm -hmm. so, so, where is converged infrastructure going in the sense of, Hmm. It's happening, so converged infrastructure is no longer just going to happen, yeah. it's kind of happening. Converged infrastructure is going to drive some interesting things. It already has been, it has been driven as well as drivers. So there's a push-pull effect going on there about uh, how do we deal with this converged environment and its impact onto the network space, and then the network dealing with, okay, we got a whole lot of these package systems coming into this environment, and is it pre-packaged for one environment? Okay, what's the cost basis of this? as well because is it cheaper to build it myself or is it cheaper to buy as one package system? And then that cheaper is a very important question because you have a net, you know, net present value concept you have to do with this. Is the cheaper really a question of the capital costs or the cost of buying the stuff, the licenses, and the people to know how to put it together? And then after it's deployed, how do you manage it? So converged infrastructure are going to become a, just a single point you're going to see everywhere. It's going to become the de facto standard in an environment out there because it turns a data center into a turnkey Lego kind of aspect. We can start deploying these, these converged environments in nice little ways. I mean, even in Avaya, we're deploying converged environments. Cisco yeah. is. Uh, you, you see it coming from every direction, which means that's another problem. And if so how, does, how do you guys think differently? Obviously, Avaya, you guys are in the big, big whale category. And mm -hmm. you got companies like Nutanus that have come out of the woodwork, Nimble Storage, these guys just, yeah. I mean, quite frankly, no one would fund Nutanus when they first started. They were talking about thinking differently. D. Raj was talking to me, he's like, hey, you know, well, we had a hard time convincing people that this was going to happen. Next thing you know, they're doing very, yeah, very well. So, yeah. so, so again, that's an example of thinking differently. So how do you guys think differently? So what do you guys need to do? We, we think about this in a lot of interesting ways. So, I mean, as I was trying to say this to guys, like, when you have all these different converged environments and they're all by different vendors, if they don't have an interoperable way, you've got a problem because you don't want to be locked into a single vendor. That's one of the aspects we take by this thing. We use standard operation procedures, we use open source technology, we use open standards. We're approaching it from the aspect of, we know real-time applications and real-time networking better than anybody else in the industry, right? We have developers running software for iPads and Androids and real-time software that's voice and video, and we tune the network to make sure it can deal with that. And that was an environment we noticed too, is that a lot of the failures in real-time applications is because you haven't configured the environment properly. You might get the QoS settings in the network properly, but did you get all the buffers tuned properly in that conversion environment? Because if you didn't, you're going to have a lot of problems in your real-time application. Now, we look at this, okay, we got real-time because we have UC as a service. We work with a lot of service providers now, and they're offering this as in a conversion environment. You have UC as a service, you have contact center as a service, on our network, in our environment. But when I go to healthcare, another customer of ours who also buys these services, their real-time service is that radiological data I just talked about. Their real-time service is the patient data. And I can use that over again in education, in the manufacturing, you know, 
it's an important thing to th change that. So our aspect in this debate is like, how do we make sure that the environment is doing what they need to be to run their business? If your business is, is cooking chicken, you shouldn't care about the network. <laughs> you should be worried about the productivity to make more chicken, right? I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that, because real time is a great word, right? It gets thrown around all yes. the time, and, and what is real time, and it's really contextually sensitive, right? It's really about what's real time for you to, to do something important, or to make an important decision, or to make an important move, Absolutely. right? There's, there's really no single definition of what is real time. No, no. I think there are, uh, there are certain elements of real time that most people can agree on, all right? It's been around forever, voice. Okay, that's, that's semi-real time. But actually, in reality, you can step back and say, okay, I have accepted certain levels of quality on cell phone that I will never accept on a landline. And that's a certain user experience you got to make sure you meet, or your users are going to complain. Right? So that's it's real time. It's user defined. It has absolutely nothing exactly. to do with real time or not real time. Exactly. It's all about expectation. And right? that's the subjective nature of the word real time. Right? We will accept different types of real time on different environments. And if you don't meet that human expectation, you're going to have problems. Your user base is going to yell, they're going to demand their service or say you're not doing your job, blah, blah, blah. The other issue the aspect is that next one. What is the user? A doctor's got a completely different set of what his expectations of a real-time application, what he would deem real-time, versus a stock trader. Right. Right? One's worried about human life, the other one's worried about billions of dollars on the line for something not working for a few minutes. Right? I think you ask them what real-time is, they're going to have completely different definitions of it. And if you can't meet it, you've got a problem. But to solve it actually comes down to very similar problem sets. Right? It's quality of the, of the network, it's quality of the application on the end device, it's quality of the experience of the user into it and his expectations. Which goes back to your, your point, you know, John, about analytics. It means you can't be reactive anymore. You have to be proactive and seeing things happen before someone has to pick up a phone or complain that they can't pick up the phone or any other aspect of this thing. You have to be able to react before any problem ever really exists. So Paul, my final question to you. What is the biggest game changer that you're going to see in the networking space in the next couple of years? As you know, things like Peer 2.0, this community comes together, mm -hmm. you have software-defined networking, you have cloud, you have mobile, the user experiences are changing up and down the stack, get big data, internet of things. I mean, it's almost a perfect storm in all the theaters of innovation. Absolutely. Um, there are two aspects. There's the things you won't see and the things you will see. All right? The things happen in the background, like Peer 2.0 is going to drive a whole, it, we've seen the conversations happen here, it's fantastic we talk among us, ourselves and where we've been, where we're going, the things we can do now that we couldn't do before will lead us to the new business models and new capabilities to deploy services faster to people in residential environments. You've got CDN aspects and all that. It's a pretty cool environment. Um, but then there's the actual user space that you will see things change, right? We're sitting here right now with you guys having two laptops in the desk. I look around the environments where I look in IT environments, I don't see laptops or even desktops in environments anymore. I see 90% of people walking around, of the younger generation it is, with just tablets, right? Their whole world is that tablet, and that's going to drive a whole new way of having to deal with a network as a problem, right? How you communicate and your expectation of the world. I laugh because I watch it my daughter um, every night when she gets home from school, where when I was you know, her age, you know, all of our friends got together after school. How do they do it? They all get on a Skype. And I look at her, she's sitting there doing homework and she's got six other of her friends, other girls on this Skype session communicating across to their kitchen tables. That is going to drive an expectation into yeah. the workforce. Yeah, and certainly mobile as well yeah, is driving right. that even more Absolutely. with, with app-specific integrated communications. Yep. So when you get that user base that expects one, they're, they're going to expect that when they get to work. So real time, yeah. in your opinion, is table stakes at this point. Absolutely. For all applications. Absolutely. Every application has its own concept of real time. And in, it, it differs so dramatically no matter where you go. Paul Udenby Hagen, Chief Architect of IA Networking, co-author of IEEE 8021 AQ, Showed us Path Bridging. Thanks for joining us here in theCUBE. Peer 2.0, inaugural CUBE event here, their first event. Great community, small kernel of folks, experts here, expanding the industry. This is theCUBE on the ground, extracting the signal from the noise. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>